thank you, Karen. But thank you all for coming out on such a horrible evening. If it makes you feel any better, I'm taking this dog and pony show to St. Albert, Alberta tomorrow, and it's actually, it's actually snowing there. So. You, you knew, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> Can you hear me at the back? No. It's okay, yes. Yes? Okay. I thought you died. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here, Nick, because I'm actually going to read the story tonight called The Lazarus Effect. <laughs> now, you, some of you folks, and I don't know how many, were kind enough to come out this time last year. And um, I, I really want to try not to repeat myself and do the same act I did last year. So as Karen said, I'm going to read you a somewhat eclectic selection tonight. Um, I don't know what your stamina is like. You, you, mere fact you're here, because I've got eight possible readings. I'll see how time goes. I always remember an Englishman watching an Irishman drink eight pints of Guinness consecutively. And he said, oh boy, I can't admire your taste, but by God I admire your stamina. <laughs> and I wouldn't have the stamina to sit through consecutive eight readings. And I always find these things go better if they're interactive and people ask me questions. And most people want to know what makes a writer tick, and I have no idea, but I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, if you play a few notes, I'll, I'll wing it. So what I'd like to do is read a section and then stop for questions, and then read another section. Just see how the evening goes. And I want to put only one constraint. Um, I haven't had my supper yet, and I'm expected for a gourmet feast at the Harbour House at 9.05, so. <laughs> say again. Hastings House. Hastings House. Oh. How did you manage that? Are you serious? No. <laughs> so without much further ado, this is the very first book in the series, The Irish Country Doctor. And many of you will know that it concerns the, the antics of a young man fresh from medical school and a remarkably crusty old rural general practitioner called Fingal Flaherty O'Reilly. And this is chapter two from The Irish Country Doctor, when the young man and Sometimes it's difficult to take people back to a hierarchical structure that no longer exists. You know, I'm 71 years old, but I'm Patrick to the dental receptionist. When I was 24 years old, a senior general practitioner was Sir, and the specialist was God, but you whispered it. <laughs> so you have to remember that this young man is somewhat in awe of his senior, and he's standing just about to ring the doorbell of the huge three-story house in Ireland, because in those days GPs practiced out of their own homes. Um, Dr. O'Reilly must run his practice from his home, Barry thought. And if the man's voice raised and hectoring that Barry could hear coming from behind the drawn curtains of the window was anything to go by, the doctor was in and at his work. You're an idiot, Seamus Galvin. A born again, bradling, but Jesusly bollocks of a buck idiot. What are you? Barry could not hear the reply. Somewhere inside, a door banged against the wall. He took a step back and glanced over his shoulder at a gravel walkway leading from the front gate, rose bushes flanking the path. He sensed movements and swung back to face a large man. A huge man standing legs a straddle in the open doorway. The ogre's bent nose was alabaster. The rest of his face puce, presumably, Barry thought, because it must be tiring carrying a smaller man by the collar of his jacket and the seat of his trousers. As well, the small man wriggled and made a high-pitched squeak. He waved his left foot, which Barry noticed was quite bare. The large man swung the smaller one to and fro on ever-increasing excursions then released his grip, and Barry gaped as the little victim's upward flight and keening were both cut short by a rapid descent into the nearest rosebush. Buck, Egypt, the giant roared and hurled a shoe and sock after the ejectee. Barry flinched. 
He held his bag in front of him. Next time, Seamus Galvin, you dirty little bugger, the next time you come here after hours on my half day and you want me to look at your sore ankle, wash your bloody feet, you hear me, Seamus Galvin? Harry turned away, ready to beat a retreat. But the path was blocked by the departing Galvin touching his footwear, hobbling towards the gate and muttering, Yes, Dr. O'Reilly, sir. I will, Dr. O'Reilly, sir. I promise, Dr. O'Reilly, sir. Barry thought of the cyclist who had given directions to the, to the village and why, at the mere mention of O'Reilly's name, the cyclist had fled. If, if, this, if what Barry had witnessed in the example of the man's bedside manner, and what the hell do you want standing there with both legs the same length and a face on you like a Lurgan spade? For those not familiar, in the town of Lurgan, the spade used for digging turf tends to be six inches longer than the regular turf spade, hence a face like a Lurgan spade. Barry swung to face his interrogator. Dr. O'Reilly? No, the archangel bloody Gabriel cannot read the plate on the wall. Um, I, I, I'm Laverty. Laverty? Well, bugger off, I'm not buying. Barry was tempted to take the advice, but he held his ground. I'm, I'm Dr. Laverty. I answered your advertisement in the British Medical Journal. I was to have an interview about the assistant's position. I will not let this man bully me, he thought. That Laverty. Well, Jesus, man, why on earth didn't you say so? O'Reilly offered a hand the size of a soup plate. His handshake would have done justice to one of those machines that reduce motor cars to the size of suitcases. Barry felt his knuckles grind together, but he refused to flinch as he met Dr. O'Reilly's gaze. He was staring into a pair of deep-set brown eyes hidden under bushy eyebrows. He noticed the deep laugh lines around the eyes and saw that the pallor had left O'Reilly's nose, a large bent proboscis with a definite list to port. It had now assumed the plum colour of the surrounding cheeks. The pressure on Barry's hand eased. Come in, Laverty, O'Reilly said, and stepped aside. Door on your left. Barry still wondered about Galvin's ejection went into the room with drawn curtains. An open roll-top desk stood against one green wall. Piles of prescription pads, papers, and what looked like patients' records lay in splendid disarray in the desktop. Above O'Reilly's framed diploma hung, Trinity College, Dublin, 1936. Have a pew, O'Reilly said, and lowered his bulk into a swivel chair. Barry settled his bag on his lap and glanced round. An examining table and set of folding screens jostled with an instrument cap. Dr. O'Reilly pushed, <coughs> excuse me, pushed a, a set of half-moon spectacles onto his bent nose and said, so you want to be my assistant? Barry had thought so, but after seeing the departure of Seamus Galvin, he wasn't so sure. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> of course you do, said O'Reilly, putting out a briar and holding a lighted match above the bone. It'll be a golden opportunity for a young man. <laughs> so that's the introduction to the redoubtable doctor. Single flap of your O'Reilly. And that took me 15 minutes and I'm dry. If any of you tell my Irish friends, if Harry, you know. I've seen drinking water in public. Have you any questions? Yes, ma'am. So the, the very first time I encountered your writing was with the initial publication of The Apprenticeship of Dr. Lafferty. Yes, ma'am. And I noticed you changed the name. Why the change in title? Oh, that one, well, it's. Uh, I didn't, my agent did. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy getting published. And a million years ago, I was lucky enough to publish a collection of short stories about Ireland called Only Wounded. I was even luckier. A gentleman called Nick Bantock was kind enough to write a blurb for me. 
and I repaid his kindness by misspelling, misspelling his name on the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that will be corrected on the re-release. <laughs> At this point my works plummeted to instant obscurity. I had written a novel. Uh, and the publisher who did the short stories was interested in literary fiction. I don't write literary fiction. I leave that up to Michael Ondaatje and people like that. Um, and I was devastated. I couldn't place my novel. And I used to live on Bourne Island. And I ran into Nick Bantic and told him my troubles. And he said, leave it with me. And he found me a wonderful man called Salman Nensi. Sounds like an escapee from the Arabian Nights. Anyway, good old Sal got me published with a company called Insomniac Press in Toronto. I did ask the owner, why Insomniac? And he said, our books are so good, they'll keep you awake all. <laughs> and I said, yeah, we think the obverse. Your books are so horrible, you'll put people to sleep even if they're insomniacs. <laughs> Didn't matter. It was about these characters. I wanted to call it the Wiley O'Reilly. He did focus groups, and I, I, I don't mean to be patronizing, it's his words, not mine. That was a bit uh, complicated for the average North American reader. So he said, you have to come up with another title. Well, <coughs> Insomniac Press had a gay and lesbian wing, and I said, okay, let's call it Dr. O'Reilly's Peculiar Practice. <laughs> <See that thing. laughs> He, he wouldn't buy that. Uh, we tried a whole stack of stuff, and eventually I said, well, bugger it, Mordecai Richler got away with it. We'll call it The Apprenticeship, not of Duty Kravitz, but of Dr. Laverty. And under that title, it was published, and once again, soared to instant obscurity. Do any of you know the works of Jack White? Jack writes extraordinarily well about King Arthur and the Knights Templar, and some of these abstruse Scottish heroes, if you have any time for people like that. Anyway, Jack was at some writer's convention in Chicago, and I was working on a new book, and my phone rang, and a, a lovely coffee-colored voice said, can I speak to Patrick Taylor? What do you want? Um, I'm an acquiring editor. I said, no, you're not. You're a salesman up at the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and the phone went again. Don't hang up. Okay, all right, but... Your friend Jack White gave me your apprenticeship. I want to buy it for Forge for a subsidiary of St. Martin's Press. Hello, would you, you've been playing in the backyard. Would you like to play for the Calgary Flames? <laughs> Not the Canucks, the Flames. <laughs> anyway, um, I said, that would be nice. But she said, we'll have to change the title. And she said, in the States, there are two things above all that will sell. One is doctor and one is Irish. And we've got to get doctor an Irish in the title. And the whole damn series has been an Irish country, doctor, village, Christmas girl, courtship, and then I had to break with an Irish student doctor. And an Irish country wedding, it's the next one. And I've, I've just finished a new one. And again, it's set in Dublin and the North. And so I'm just calling it Fingal O'Reilly Irish Doctor. And I made a fundamental mistake if you look what's at the top of the bestseller lists. If I'd had enough sense to call an Irish country vampire. 